everybody back for another episode of Matt Chat Live with my friend over here, Ian Price Murphy. Woo -woo! We're going to be talking bookkeeping today. Excitement of bookkeeping. It's so exciting. I can't wait for you to meet Ian. Okay. <laughs> being silly but ian is really really awesome so welcome to uh, matt chat live ian i'm glad you're here today thank you thank you so much and i would love it if you could just tell everybody a little bit about who you are and what you do and how cool you are yes um so i am an anti-spreadsheet bookkeeper we use a method called profit first which i'm sure we'll talk all about uh i have a bookkeeping service that's based in new york i live in california my bookkeepers are all over the US and our whole focus is helping small business owners answer the questions that they actually are asking so that they can make smart decisions rather than just kind of like having these numbers on a piece of paper. Yeah, so killer, so amazing. So she's she's coast to coast, y'all. She got <laughs> bookkeepers alliance everywhere. They're, they're marching down the streets. We wanna help, we wanna help. So. That's the big thing. One of the things I asked Ian when we when we initially met and talked was, uh, you know, for a lot of you that are that are watching or listening today. Um, by the way, hello to everybody on LinkedIn and Facebook and YouTube and in the podcast world and iTunes and Spotify and Amazon and Google and blah 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 and everywhere. And hello, right? So uh, and Bookkeepers United uh, in, Incorporated World headquarters, whatever. So uh, one of the things I was concerned about as a as a former um, brick and mortar business owner, uh, and definitely as an entrepreneur and somebody that has to keep up with my books. And by the way, I hope my bookkeeper is not listening because I have not kept up with my books the way I should, and I'm in trouble with her. But that's a whole nother story. <laughs> um, she keeps me in line, like I'm sure Ian does with her clients. And I appreciate that. But um, you know, if you already are a business owner and you already have a bookkeeper, you feel like, well, why would I want to hire Ian if I'm already happy with my bookkeeper? Or maybe you're not. That's another story we could talk about too. Um, so I asked that question to Ian earlier. So Ian, you know, in that thought process, if somebody's watching, listening today, they they can get some information for sure as a bookkeeper, what thing might be good for their business. But why would somebody want to uh, contact you? Yeah, I think the short answer is even though, you know, our business is called Moxie Bookkeeping because we've been around so long that we used to be the people that would come to your office and sit there for a half a day and go through all your stuff. That's not who we are anymore because of the changes in technology and um, all sorts of different things, you know, just the way that things are done and the way the industry is moving. So where we really live and shine is to be kind of the outsourced financial department because one of the big questions and one of the reasons I think it's worth the extra money to pay for an agency over a freelancer sometimes is that business owners, even if they have a great bookkeeper, they still don't always know that they have a great bookkeeper because they are not CFOs. And so they look at these reports and they go, yeah, I guess. I guess. Or what does this mean? What can I afford? How do I use this information? And the bookkeeper kind of goes, that's not my job. And so as someone who, you know, owns a small business as, as well, um, I have to have those answers and I really want to be able to provide those answers. So we often work with people who either already have a bookkeeper or are their own bookkeeper. And of course we do the bookkeeping if you don't, but to be that second set of eyes to say, you know what, we've gone in, we've done the month close for you and everything looks great. Here are the reports, do you understand them? Do they make sense to you? Do you wanna talk about them? Um, and then we layer on top of this, this cash management system that sort of exists separate from the bookkeeping to help you know exactly like by looking at your bank balance, what can I afford? Yeah. So. Uh, a lot of times with small businesses, they can't afford anything because they don't have a bank balance. They just start, they're existing as a business and cost of goods sold and covering their expenses and this, that, and the other. Um, so in that case, it's going to be pretty tight, but there are places because, you know, as business owners, we value certain things and we look at certain things. And many times we're stressed by having to do certain, buy certain types of things or pay certain bills, right? So we're strapped down, but then your eyes come in, you might say, oh, do you realize that if you did this and this, you'd now have an extra $5,000 a month in your budget? Yeah, and oftentimes that sounds like raise your prices by 5%. People undervalue themselves so heavily. They think that people won't pay more 
Mm. I saw online uh, an acrylic shrimp purse yesterday. <laughs> yes, I was just looking for one of those. I can't I wait. I know, right? Yes. Over a thousand dollars. People are buying the weirdest things for the weirdest amount of money. If you're providing real value, you should have no problem charging a rate that will keep you your doors open. Otherwise, all you're doing is is slowly starving yourself to death. If you can't afford things that you know you need, that's not a business. That's a death sentence, honestly. Yeah. Wow, that's a that's something else, and uh, definitely something that people don't want to hear, you know. But it's it's a you know it's a reality, and there's some that's the benefit of what you do as a business is be able to help find people succeed, and sometimes success requires a little bit of uh, grit, right? A little bit of uh, digging into places where we may not want to, and it ends up being really the best thing for us, right? So, uh, in in that thought process, what might be like some of the I mean, you've been through a lot of experiences over the years in bookkeeping and talking to clients and things of that nature. And what might be either some of the most common thing that you've seen or maybe one of the most memorable moments you've seen in the sense of being able to readjust somebody's uh, budgets to where they actually started making some money? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that that is really common and, and those two are tied together. The mistake that's usually made is that people are almost always um, undercharging for what they really need to be charging to to stay sustainably in business. There's some Ben Franklin quote that I'm going to get totally wrong that essentially says never compete on price because someone is always willing to go out of business faster than you are. And so the you know being willing to test uh, in a in an appropriate way and again five percent really generally isn't noticeable, um, but can make a huge difference for for your business. And the other thing I see a lot is people constantly reinvesting their quote unquote profits back into the business, which means it's actually not profit. It's you've just now made it an expense. Mm -hmm. And so, and so without clarity around why am I spending this money? What return do I expect it to have for me in terms of new sales? You know, I think a lot of people just sort of feel like, well, if I just throw more money at the problem and make more money, make more sales that I'll be okay. But, you know, there was a story I just read of a woman who who's an online coach and she had a launch, whatever they call it, for her for her new program and brought in over $250,000. Well, that sounds great until you look at her expenses. And I think she only kept about 5000 of that. And wow. so, like, that's a big, like, whoa, we need to look at all of this. You know, are you over? Um, She's over 250000 only kept five grand. That's right? Just She's way over something. Way over something. And so was it the ads? Was it the, you know, support? Whatever it was and being able to look at that and and have some guidelines to be able to say, you know, at your size of business, you should have at least 10% profit, cash profit, not what they call accounting profit, which is the bottom line, which is almost never what's in your actual bank, you know, but like cash profit that you can access separate from what you're getting paid, separate from what you owe in taxes. Uh, and if you've got those kind of guidelines in place, it makes it much easier to make intentional decisions about how you choose to spend. Yeah. So I'm thinking there's two different thought processes here. One now, as I'm an uh, entrepreneur, you know, I'm a coach consultant. So my, my price points and my, my book keeping, keeping is quite different than when I was in a retail brick and mortar. So, Absolutely. you know, you'd said about add 5%. So, you know, I know for a fact that, you know, I would run my my business at map pricing, minimum advertised pricing and all the things, right? So I was competitive with the internet. So I would play that, that game with customers all the time. Well, I got lower on the internet. Once in a while it happens, but you run map pricing typically supposed to be protected by the vendors, right? So map is always at about at about 30 points, right? So if you're at 30 points and you're at map pricing, or maybe map pricing might be, I don't know, maybe maps, well, maps are typically 30 points. So, but if you go up 5%, you're at 35% versus 30, and then you're no longer competitive with with uh, internet. So in that theory of raising 5%, and I'm throwing this really big curveball at you, because I'm thinking it's something that people might be thinking about. Sure. If, you raise, if you raise that 5%, one, you're not going to be able to have as many sales anymore because it's not that you're you're undervaluing yourself. It's that there's really legitimate competition there. And as a brick and mortar, you know, you can't afford to compete with the big boxes. 
right? So then if you're at 30 points to go 35 or 40, you're you're definitely – so then, of course, the next thing is like, well, you got value. Like I'm a local guy. I can do things of like that. It's the internet. Blah, blah. I, bar all those conversations, just straight numbers. Yeah. Um, then what's the thought process there instead of just saying just bump it 5%? Well, to me, it feels a little bit like an off the rack suit, right? Of course, you have to tailor it to your unique position. So the general concept is raised 5%. But what you might actually find is, you know, these are the 10 SKUs that people come in looking for that they're comparing to the internet. Fine. I can't, I can't sh shift much pricing there because that will drive people away. But when they walk into the store to get that because it's easier or cheaper or whatever, then I can have things that are higher value, higher ticket, higher margin available that they'll either impulse purchase or it's harder to find online or there's some interaction that they will need or want to use. So one of my clients I had was a, was a yarn store in Manhattan, right? So like not great margins, ridiculous overhead. And one of the brilliant things that they did was they started having classes. You know, like they had this retail space, shop closed at five, they would do, you know, an hour of knitting, crocheting, et cetera, classes in the evening, which provided something that you can't get online as easily, which is that feeling of like community support. And, you know, and, and it, it just, it bonded people to them in this really intense way so that they now had this super loyal following so that they didn't have to compete on price anymore. And they actually could raise some of those basic prices up a little bit and because people, people, have... people didn't care at all. Yeah. People didn't care at all because, you know, I mean, and that gets back to this like value thing, right? right? So finding the way that that works, not just for you, but for your clients. How does charging more actually serve your clients better? Now that's that's the sweet spot. Yeah, oh, I totally agree. I mean, I'm down with that because that's the same, same thing that I preached to my, my employees and stuff at the time because – Obviously, you know, we provided things in our store that you would never get online. As a matter of fact, most people that would buy certain things online, I own a music retail store. So if they bought an instrument or something online, they're going to get it in a box that got shipped to them from some factory, some warehouse somewhere. It's going to be crap when it gets to their house. Then they're going to come bring it to my store and say, hey, can you fix this? I'm like, yeah, if you'd have bought it here in the first place, it would have been perfect when you took it home. But now you bought something and now you got to bring it here. So how much did it really cost you? Right. So people don't understand. They just they just look at price and they go that they go there. So, you know, that thought process you said, you know, we did a lot of community stuff like same thing. I think it's very important for any brick and mortar store to be you know, plugged into their community and providing opportunities for community to engage. And then in that instance, obviously, those people are not most of the time those people are not going to question anything. They just come into the store and they say, I need X, Y, Z. They go grab it and they pay for it. People that don't know you that well, people that are just shopping and have their phones, they're going to come in and be the the price Nazis, right? I have to say it that way, but they're going to be like, oh, I can get it online. For, yours is $4, but I can get it for $3.50. Okay, whatever, right? You know? <laughs> so. Yeah, and, and the answer is great. Go to, you know, like you're not my perfect ideal date either. Like we don't have to be here together. You definitely don't have to buy from me, you know? Right. And this idea that we should appeal to everyone, I think is also just crazy. You know, it's not true in our yeah, personal yeah, lives. Why should it be true in business? Right, right. And you're absolutely right. I think that sometimes it can be fear when somebody might need a client and they're, they don't want to just walk out the door. They'd rather take a loss. But at the end of the day, they're going to expect the loss every time now. So you've got to set a standard in your business. So I think there are some values there. So, okay, besides that point now, uh, for regular small businesses that are uh, – I just know that so many people are strapped. I mean, especially now with 2020, there are some businesses that are doing fairly well and then um, most everybody else is not. Um, and now we're trying to circle back and come around. And there's so many things, social media you can do and community stuff, things, and there's limitations because, you know, how many people can be together in a space and masks and all, all this stuff, right? But um, you know, what are some areas that you find most common that can be reassessed to create more more business flow, more flow for, for the business, like not necessarily cost of good flow. Like you just said, that's just reinvesting back into the thing, but you know, take away for somebody that has some actual cash, right? Some money profit. Yeah. And I, you know, I think even for people that are really strapped, the thing sometimes isn't to look at what else you can do, but what you can stop doing. So now's a great time to let go of, you know, low, 
margin services, low margin items, things that are not driving the most sales, you know, unless it's like the low ticket offer to get people in the door. But, you know, if you're doing 12 things, and this is sort of like that Pareto 80-20 rule, if you, and, and just to aside, like, this is why I love bookkeeping. This is why I think it's super exciting. If I know what my numbers are, I can look at and find the 20% of things that I do that are generating 80% of my income. And so I can be like, great, so let me just get rid of that other 80% of stuff that I do. There's no reason for me to be everything to everyone. Now I can focus my time, effort, and energy and get better results in ideally less time with, with less stress. Super. And, and you know, if people are like, I don't either have that information or I don't, it does, that doesn't work out for me. You know, the other exercise that I just took a ton of clients through in the beginning of the pandemic, you know, was what is it that you do for your clients? Not what's your service or what's your product, but what is it that you're providing for them? Is it an experience? Is it a relief? Whatever it is, you know, how do you continue to, to give them that thing that they want and know you for in a different way? So, I mean, restaurants were kind of the easy one on this. What we're giving them is the ability to not have to think about what's for dinner or make it. Great. Well, you can't now come sit down inside. All right. Is the weather good enough for outdoor seating? No. Or no, we're not allowed to sit out. Fine. Fine. Then we could potentially do takeout, you know, drive through, whatever it is. Some people switch to delivery. There was a, a restaurant that we worked with that started delivering meal kits since that's what they could afford to do. So they're still taking out the let me decide what to have and let and let's save you a bunch of time on making it and now you know it's going to come out pretty pretty much like the way that we do it for you and so that allowed them to really continue to serve their client base and and satisfy the needs that their client base had without completely shutting down or revamping everything um, or being so attached to but we do it this way that they couldn't get creative um, and I just, I think that that sort of creative problem solving is so undervalued in business. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, I, I love to think that way too. And there's, I've got a million examples that we could probably go through, which would take forever, but uh, <laughs> I'm trying to think of ways that we, you know, we can, we can help people that are listening today with some serious issues they might be facing. Um, you said the 80, 20 rule. So I'm thinking, uh, well, I know for a fact that a lot of times people get really attached to their stuff, you know, and their business and, um, uh, for me, in my last uh, retail business, I had a plethora of of items in the store, all kinds of things, lots of stuff that that would sometimes not really sell, right? And we could get rid of them. However, there are seasons that those things are important to be there, and because it's like a place like a music retail business, you're going to have so many different people looking for so many different things. If you don't have them constantly, they're constantly not going to come back. Right, they're just mm -hmm. going to buy it online, and that's a lot of business to lose because accessories and value add on sales is really bread and butter for a lot of places like that. It's not the high ticket guitars and drums and things like that. It's all the all the accessories, right? So you have to have those things around. Um, you have to have stock. You know, people want to come in and see when they walk into a store. They want to see stuff, not just like five things. Go, okay, what's this a flea market, right? So, in that instance, when you're talking about the eighty twenty, I think that's fantastic. I think there's a lot of things that could be cut down. There's a lot of items that. Uh, may not necessarily uh, have to be there. Um, but when there is that situation where you got to, it's the necessary evil, like there's some things you're just gonna have to have hanging on the wall. You know, how do you handle that kind of a scenario with a customer that's really wrestling with, well, I, I can't do that. Ian, I've got to keep everything here. Yeah, I mean, again, I think that rather than saying I can't do that, the question is, how do I make that work for me? There you go. You know, that just that mindset shift can be so important because, you know, it may be something very different and uncomfortable for us, but if we can justify it with a story that appeals to our customers, then great. You know, so yeah, people want to see stuff hanging on the walls, but what if, and obviously I'm not speaking from any particular place here, what if we decided we didn't have enough stuff to hang on the wall that would look good, right? It would end up looking like a flea market because we don't want to have 
one size pick in every color combination ever. But we do know that people are going to come in and want something unique. Could we put it in the back and go for like sleek minimalism up front? Thank you, Apple Store, for making that okay. Where maybe the, you know, what are you looking for? It becomes more of a concierge experience. Let me, you know, you know what? I think we've got something special for you. Everybody likes to be special. And then you can go in the back and rush through the flea market and be like, yep, here's the one that we've got. And now I know I need to write that on my reorder list. Or, you know, if it takes a week to restock and one other person might come in during that time, you know, so a lot of times you end up paying a higher per piece price when you buy lower, but sometimes tying up all of your cash to get a 10% discount is not the best idea, right? Cash, cash is king. Cash yeah, is the yeah. lifeblood of your business. I tell you, those vendors could be pretty, pretty, uh, pretty, pretty uh, smart with their stuff. You know, you're like, oh, you got to get this right now. This is a deal we've only got going right now. And plus you get free shipping. And not only you're like, oh, my God, free shipping. That'd be saving another two hundred dollars there. You guys are like, I, I can't not do this. I have to do this. But we haven't paid the electric bill. That's all right. I don't care. We'll just do that. And then we'll pay electric bill that later this week. Right. Right. <laughs> I gotta have right. these so I can sell them so I can pay the electric bill. Yes, and, yes, that's the whole point. It's a wrestling match. Right, and so this is where I think that this this profit first system, sorry, other side, boop, this profit first system really comes in handy because when you make that sale, you immediately take out a percentage to replenish inventory. You immediately take out a percentage to pay your taxes. You immediately take out a percentage to hold aside for profit and then only what's left over goes into your overhead spending account and that becomes your natural budget. You never have to create another budget again. Also, so that's something you could do like for example in QuickBooks or something like that. You'd be able to set up it would just be accounts. So, you know, item XYZ once it's sold, the cost of goods sold is 5 bucks, right? And the profit is, you know, $1.37, let's say. So then in that $1.37, that $1.37 is split up into three places and goes to three different accounts so that you only see certain things in certain places. Is that kind of how it would work or? No. And the ah. reason it wouldn't work like that is because of something you yourself said at the start of this. I'm behind on my bookkeeping. So yes, you could do all of this crazy stuff in QuickBooks and divide it all up so that when you looked, and I'm looking at you, when you looked, it was there. But the way that bookkeeping works is rear view mirror, right? It's mapping what already happened in the past, which is important. We need that. But we also need, as business owners, to be able to see the, the road ahead, right? And so this is why I do this a lot when I'm talking about profit first and bookkeeping is the bookkeeping tells you where you've been, which you need to know. Profit first is like the headlights illuminating the road in the darkness ahead. So I, well, what I'm talking about is actually creating separate physical bank accounts. So you have one account that's your income account where everything gets deposited to. And then once a week, twice a month, once a month, you go in and you divide that up by percentage so that it's responsive to uh, income fluctuations. And you say, great, I just made a thousand dollar deposit. I'm going to put $400 of that into my inventory and a hundred of dollars of that into my profit and a hundred dollars of that into my owner's pay and whatever my taxes so that I'm only left over with a couple hundred to go into my operating expense. And what that allows you to do as the business owner is what I'm pretty darn sure you do most mornings, which is pick up your phone, log on to your banking app and go, Oh, that's what I've got in there. Okay. That's what I can afford. <laughs> and that's not the true balance at all. At all. And that's it balance. is. Unless you separate it out so that it actually is. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And no, so that's, that's why I'm all in on this system is because it just, it gives you at a glance financial clarity without spreadsheets, without budgets, without software. It doesn't replace what your bookkeeper does, but you know, it's like it's beans and rice. They're, yeah. they're great on their own, but when you put them together, something magical happens, right? Mm -hmm. no, that's great. Great, great advice. And I'm glad we get a chance to talk about this. That I know there's a lot of folks out there that kind of think some some of the things I'm talking about, I don't have that business anymore. I, I miss it, but I'm also thanking the Lord I don't have it anymore because <laughs> I just uh, I couldn't imagine what uh, 2020 would have been like with that kind of a store. But um, nevertheless, I know some of the thought processes and another thought process, I mean, we don't even go in this because it take too much time, would be taxes. And uh, for me, taxes was like uh, it was like a spare bank account. 
and I would use taxes that way, which could get you in big trouble. Um, big what, trouble. When you got to pay the tax bill and it's not really there anymore, you're screwed. But you know, I, I, I remember times I would I would be borrowing from the tax account to pay. It was still my money. It hadn't been, you know, actually paid. It was still just in a, a different account in, inside of QuickBooks, right? So we'd have what the balance was. Was it say there? there yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's a big deal. <laughs> so true. So true. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, thank the Lord I, I was able to keep things straight there. But uh, it's a it's a strong, strong temptation. And it's really easy to, if you don't do what you're talking about, that's the whole point I'm bringing this up. It's really easy to be in the wrong mindset and and get yourself really messed up, uh, even even unintentionally. It doesn't mean that you did it because you're being crooked or, or deceptive. You just sometimes don't even know. And because you don't even know, you end up getting in the hole and it, it, it's such a really, really deep hole to get out of. And what you do, Ian, besides just bookkeeping is really help to uh, to help train some mindsets of people in their businesses that are really connected to their business. I'm sure most people are very passionate about what they do and bringing up brick and mortar, but there's also, um, you know, uh, real estate people and even financial assistant people, financial aid people, and uh, of course, coaches, consulting, there's all kinds of people out there. But at the end of the day, we all like what we do and we all like the profit we can get. And that we don't want to mess around with certain things, but there are things that are important to to pay attention to, right? Even though I'm uh, a, a consultant and coach and you know all this kind of stuff now, um, I still have to have a 1099. I still have to come up with the taxes at the end of the year and figure out what that's going to look like. And if you think, well, I just made five thousand dollars, no, you didn't. <laughs> you just received five thousand dollars. But uh, where's that supposed to be, and where's that supposed to go? And if you know in the front side of your mind, all right, I didn't have. Okay, five thousand dollars. I just got a thousand bucks, right? So you know that you got a thousand bucks, and the rest of it goes to everything else. You're good to go. But if you start looking at that whole five grand, it's yours. You got a problem because it's not right. It's theirs. I like that one's really good. That's your, you know, <laughs> bookkeeping that humor. You probably got that at some <laughs> bookkeeping convention somewhere. I, did. <laughs> I love it. I love it. All right, so Ian, I think you're amazing, and you really help people in a way that. Um, I think some people have a, a thought process about bookkeeping services, bookkeepers. Um, I, of course, I'm on LinkedIn a lot and I get a ton of messages on LinkedIn from people that are bookkeepers and they're in Philippines or India or whatever and they want to do your stuff, right? And uh, I'm not saying that they're not good. I'm not knocking that. I'm just saying that there is there is a lot of op there are a lot of options out there for people to go to. Um, so you're, you're even saying not necessarily that you want to try to replace somebody's bookkeeper because you know that a lot of times people have great relationships, but maybe they just have a bookkeeper. You know, they just hired some company and they don't really have that relationship. It's just something they had to do and they've done it. Uh, but in your case, you're going much deeper than just saying, hey, click a button and we'll do your we'll do your taxes. Right. Yeah, That's completely yeah. different. So, you know, how can folks get a hold of you and and uh, learn more about exactly what you do and how how you can serve them? Yeah, I mean, I think our website is the easiest place to start. We're obviously all over social media as well. But yeah, moxiebookkeeping.com. Uh, it tells you a little bit more about what we do. We've got a little, you know, PDF on there about how to keep more of what you earn um, that outlines the profit first system. And, you know, and and then what I like is if, if price is really your concern, then go ahead and hire that bookkeeper from the Philippines. And now you don't have to worry about are they doing it right or not. Um, and so, you know, we we also do training with Profit First. We have a group class coming up in April. So anything you need to know, just ask me. Um, I freakishly love this stuff, like to an insane degree. And I guess <laughs> that very few people do. So I'm always happy to, to talk about it and come on things like this and just chat. Yeah, that's so great, Ian. And you're right. It's not that, not that common that you find that out there. I mean, I'm sure there is, but I, I haven't seen that much of it, you know. So it's really great to have you here. And for folks to get a chance to meet you, because anybody that's watching or listening to this that has a business, you have to have somebody's service like Ian, period. There's something about what she does that you just have to have. Um, so if you have to have it, you might as well have it right. And uh, that's one of the things that Ian is really pr uh, proud of in her life and her business career. How long have you been in business, Ian? We hired our first employee in 2003, and I had been a freelancer for almost 10 years before that. That's fantastic. So yeah. 
over 20 years experience right there behind her, not to mention the people that she's uh, got on her team. It's just, uh, I'm sure there's some amazing people that you've vetted that you've hired as well. So Indeed. again, here's one more time. Here's her website, moxiebookkeeping.com. Two Ks in that thing, moxiebookkeeping.com. And you can uh, reach out to her and find out more about what they've got going on. And of course, you know, even like she said, they may have some, some videos or some courses or things available that might be beneficial to you as well. Maybe you're not ready to hire somebody, but you want to take the first step. Um, then that's something that you can find over there at moxiebookkeeping.com. So thanks for the moxie, Ian. You got some moxie, girl. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And if there's one thing as we're getting ready to leave out here today, for those of folks that are watching or listening and uh, something we maybe touched on or maybe we didn't, um, and you have this moment now to speak to that person, what's one thing you could say to help them through uh, this this year, 2021? Um, check your mindset, keep your head up and set aside 1% of your profit into a savings account. Savings account, 1%. That's what I'm talking about. That's good advice there, folks. Good advice because you shouldn't be in debt. You know, it's, it's, you got to work your way out because there's, there's freedom in being debt free. That's for sure. So uh, thank you so much, Ian. I appreciate you being here today. And uh, thank you so much for being here at Matt Chat Live. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.